This is Tom Fox, and I would like to welcome you to Readings and Felicitations. In this podcast series, I'm going to be visiting with thought leaders, entrepreneurs, historians, and a wide variety of other people on topics that are outside the area of compliance, but are of great interest to myself and to listeners to the Compliance Podcast Network. In this podcast, I visit with John Assetti. John is an author of seven books about people, places, and things in Texas and the hill country of Texas. I previously, I interviewed him around his most recent book, Profiles in Leadership, which details leadership of business executives from Kerrville and the surrounding hill country. But it turns out John has an equally fascinating story himself, what he calls from nothing to something. This episode concludes a two-part series where we take a look at some of the key highlights of in his life, which led him to not only write about leadership and leading organizations, but also actually fulfilling those roles. So John, next then, did you actually move up to become a school principal? Well, actually, I was certified to be a principal, and I had hoped someday that I would do that when I was ready. And I found out that the, the school I was at, the lab school at the State University of New York at Geneseo, was going to be closing in a few years. And I said, hey, time for me to go. So I began looking around, and there were openings around the Rochester area, in the southern tier, where I eventually went to, a city called Olean, New York. And uh, so I applied, and um, the superintendent of schools had just been there a year. He had received his doctor's degree, he was there for a year. But the school teachers, especially high school teachers, didn't like him, because he wanted to make changes. And he said, that's what I'm here for. So they finally got rid of him. But I, was there for one year with him, and he was the greatest of all. But they kept me after that. Why, I have no idea. But then I found out after I was there a year, I said I didn't realize how far behind the school was in regard to academics. Because I had come from a campus school where they were up on top, number one in academics, because that's what they encouraged us to do. So I was a little discouraged, but then I decided well, maybe I can maybe I could uh, I can help them out, and we'll see what we can do. It was a struggle for a while because the te- some of the teachers were not used to having someone to tell them what to do. Usually, the teachers told the principal what to do. Well, that was not me. <laughs> and I began to find out that they really had they didn't have many programs at all that were encouraging to teachers and students. And so I gave myself a lot of thought and thought about the programs I had at the lab school. And one of them was the science program. I was a member of a consortium of of nine educators that belonged to this consortium where we learned about the new hands-on science programs from University of Berkeley, California, and also out of Newton, Massachusetts. And we were being trained to do that. In fact, we even visited Berkeley for a week and Newton for a week to be trained by professionals. And we came back, and then we had science kits that they gave us uh, to use. And because we were trained in using the kits, it was all hands-on science. The kids became the scientists, and the materials became the lab work that they did. And they loved it. They just loved it. So I became a trainer, and I taught all our teachers and school administrators how to teach these units of study, just like the other eight people in the consortium. And so that started, and what happened is that some of the teachers were really fascinated by it because they saw reactions from kids (laughs) who were speaking up and they were having fun learning again. Usually most of the learning was book learning. And for kids who don't like books, they're turned off right at the beginning. Turn to page 48, oh, math, oh, they were just turned off. But then if you do a math kit, math science kit, and they're manipulating materials, they love it. It's a different way of learning, and that's okay. So anyway, I became a consultant, 
and I used to travel just all over the place, all over New York, Pennsylvania, Ohio, seeing how to use these kits. And I enjoyed that very much, and, and I had fun doing that. And then another program which I started was one that I took a risk, but gee, it just worked beautifully, and it's still going on today, 28 years ago. Still going on. It was called the Partners in Education. And what I did, I approached one of the companies in town. It's called, I think it was Costo. It was, they, they made knives. And so I made an appointment to meet with the, the owner, director of the program, his financial advisor, and as well as his vice president. And they took me out to lunch to hear my proposal. For the first half hour, they ignored me completely. They were all business people. They were talking about their business. I just listened. But then I started to think, I was listening, let's see now, how can I get their attention when I'm ready to go on? I had to come up with something that was really knocked the hell out of them. And I got it. And so when they, after a half hour, they were all done eating. Said, okay, John, it's yours. What do you propose? So they said, the first thing they asked me, what's it going to cost? Typical business people, and I know that. And I was prepared. So I said, it's really not very much. I said, the initial cost is $10,000. And they all went, what? You're kidding me. I said, yes, you're right. I'm kidding you. It's not $10,000. It's $0. Boy, were they surprised to hear that. But I got their attention. <laughs> And so it was all developing programs that how we can help industry and how industry can help us because the people in school are these future workers at these places. So we worked with business people and also professional people. The university, we worked at all kinds of places. So we developed this partnership, and for a year, in fact, I remember – when they asked me again, what, how can we help you? I said, I'm looking, for, I'm looking for people that are willing to volunteer an hour a week of their time to assist our students. Just one hour, that's all. And they said, we can get that for you, no problem at all. And I said, and I would like to give our kids a chance to come over and see what your industry is all about. Because our kids don't know anything about you, including our teachers. They just don't know. They're so limited. that We love that. That's great. So we started the program, and uh, much more detail in it, which I won't go into, but they finally sent me 19 people from their industry to tutor students, not five or six, but 19. I was absolutely shocked, and my teachers were shocked that these outside people were coming in to help them, and it went over just great, by the way. And then at the same time, I had gone, I'd been working with the New York State Education Department on ideas. And they said, what about, would you like a, a person from a foreign country to come and spend a year with you at your school? I said, yeah, I'd love that. I said, well, how about Japan? I said, it's great. So they gave me a contact of some people. And I said, this is the one I want for a year. And for six months, she spent time at my home with my wife and me and a couple of kids, the younger kids, and then in six months with a person from the industry. And she taught them Japanese language, Japanese customs, traditions, dress, music, the whole works. And the kids and teachers loved it. They were not used to this kind of stuff. It was all basic stuff they were learning. So they were able to apply what this young person, she was, I believe, 24. She, they were, the teachers were able to apply the information that she taught to their academic area. And that was my purpose in doing that. And before that, we invited her to go over and give a demonstration to the people from this knife industry. <laughs> They couldn't get over it. Said, wow, is this what you people do in education today? I said, I said, yeah, but that was not true. Only we did it at my school, and they liked it. And then after that, man, they offered me everything, including the moon, at my school. 
publicity galore <laughs> in the newspaper. And I had high school people and middle school teachers and administrators who hated my guts. That's not your job. Your job is the three R's. Stop doing all that stuff. <laughs> I, oh, okay, yeah, no problem. I can just continue on. <laughs> and the teachers finally coalesced and came together and finally decided that, hey, maybe there is something else out there that we need. And everything worked out for that. And with that program, I also did a lot of traveling and did a lot of consulting work throughout the country, including the science program and the partnership program. So that was, well, that was a form of leadership. And it was something that I, uh, I enjoy because I'm not the kind of person who just wants to sit and do routine stuff. You have to think through and come up with the unique ideas that help teachers teach better and how to help students learn better. And that was my goal. That's who I was. That's what I learned at the lab school, okay? Now, also, what I did, was I, my wife and I did a lot of traveling after I, I retired. We traveled to China and taught English as a second language for three weeks in China. And we also went to Italy and Poland and taught there for three weeks each. And those were three great experiences. And in China, I contacted the principal there and asked if they would be willing to have a a pen pal program with some of our students and students in, in the United States. He said, oh, I would love that. So by the time I left, I had 10 Chinese students with all their information about them, photographs of them given to me to give to students. And then I gave a, a report to a classroom of a teacher who was interested, and they went with it. So that's who I was. And, uh, and I enjoyed my career because I became very creative, not because of my interest, but because of other people who were looking for ideas. Now, as far as leadership programs in foreign countries, uh, I went to Argentina for four weeks with a Rotary Club, and then I went back there. My wife and I went back there again, and we had a chance to visit a school all for handicapped students. And they were looking for some money, grant money. So we were able to collect $1,100 to give to them to help build their greenhouse where they were able to raise flowers and they made pots and they sold this for their school. Still going on. I went to Easter Island. I went to a Rotary Club meeting and the president was one of the big chief officers of the airport in town there. And, oh, my, he just took over with me, and he just loved it and took me to all kinds of different places. And then when we were ready to go home, he took us in his vehicle to the airport. We moved through all of the sections that where all the people were waiting to get in. He said, let's go. We're going right through. <laughs> I said, hey, not bad when you know important people. We collected, for them, we collected a $1,000. And he requested musical instruments for their kids. They had no musical instruments. I said, okay, that sounds like a good idea. So I was able to collect $1,000 to give to them. Also, I went to Cuba, a visit to Cuba, uh, which was a communist country at that time. And I met with one of the educators there and gave him some paperwork on how to reorganize a Rotary Club. They had one before Castro came in, but Castro got rid of the Rotary he said, good, I'll take this in case the time comes and we change. I can do something. He said, okay. St. Lucia, that was interesting, the island in the West Indies. Been there three times and uh, talked. To the, we taught there. We taught there for two weeks, my wife and I. We taught English as a second language. And they're all English-speaking students, all black students, black teachers. And uh, I noticed that I was placed in a room, which was the library, which was a classroom. And they had books on the shelf. And I checked some of them were back to 1930, 1940, 1950. I didn't see one kid come in the library and pick up a book. So the principals and teachers said, we would like to have some library books for the kids. Sure, okay. So I organized a committee, wrote a proposal, and asked the club president if he would be willing to support this. And that would be only to send the books, that's it. Yeah, sure. He said, but under one condition. I said, yeah, what's that? He says, if you are willing to chair this committee, 
I'll be very happy to support you. I says, at 87 years old, you're asking me to chair a committee? He said, yeah. Oh, okay, if that's what you want. So I did. We collected uh, over, are you ready for this? Over 800 books from individuals, from the library, from different groups of people, and they were all in good condition. And we boxed them, labeled them. We took them to uh, Fredericksburg, where the mailing office was located, and, and mailed them out. And then once everything was there, my wife and I made our third visit to see what it looked like. Because we had asked the agency that supported this program in QN and St. Lucia, if they would build some shelves for us. They said, yeah, we'd be very happy to. They also put rugs on the floor. They bought a couple cushions for kids. They painted the whole room. And we went there, my God, we saw so many kids. Some were sitting in these comfortable little chairs. The kids were looking at books in the, on the shelf that I never saw before. And then they had three kids. They were assigned to check books out for the kids that wanted to get library books. And that's going on right now, 20, 20 years ago, maybe 15 years ago. So that was a real plus, by the way. And I submitted a final report to the Rotary Club and said, hey, here's how, here are the procedures in case you have any new people that want to participate in an international program. Here's how they can do it if they would like to. If not, pick and choose what you want. I mentioned the partnership with industry and business. I was a trainer, and then I asked someone from industry, a young guy, if he would help me, assist me. He said, sure, I'd be very happy to. So I trained him, and then we both would go out and train other people. We would have five or six people, no, about four or five people from industry and four or five people from a school come together for three hours. And we would train them on the procedures of establishing a program that would be successful on, on, on how to do this. If not, if, you, if it's not done correctly, people will lose interest. But here's how successful programs. Now, why do I say that? I had an opportunity to go out to a conference every year in Washington, D.C., that dealt with national, international, inter, international programs on developing programs for business industry. In schools. That's where I learned all this, and I applied it. And so what happened is that we got programs all over western New York <laughs> and also Pennsylvania. We even did some programs in the southern part of Pennsylvania, and they had heard about this program. So I said, they asked me if I would come. I said, sure. And I was still the principal of the school. I used to have a person who used to would take over for me while I went away for two days. I talked about the Japanese person. My wife and I sponsor children in Nicaragua, Bolivia, El Salvador, and the Dominican Republic. We pay so much money a month to make sure they have food, clothing, medicine, school materials, and so on. And we're still doing it, and we enjoy it very much. That's the least we can do. Now, the last thing I'm going to mention is a program that I was asked to do in, in Geneseo, New York. I started the science program there, and it got a lot of attention at the lab school and also the other schools. And the county, Cataraugus County superintendent, called and asked if I would come to his office and he'd like to talk to me. I said, sure. We have no problem. So we made an appointment and went to talk to him. He said, John, I've been hearing a lot about this science program that you're in charge of. He said, what would be the possibility of having a county-wide science program held here in Geneseo at the lab school? And I said, what do you mean? What are you talking about? He said, we would need some people that you know that you met in Washington to be able to come down, and we would pay their expenses. We would not give them any salary. We would pay their flight and their food and their board. And that's all you have to do is organize the program. I said, that's a pretty big deal. So we ended up with 35 teachers all over the United States that I knew at these conferences, contacted each one and explained to them what we're interested in doing, and ask them if they will be willing to come. They all said yes. <laughs> Couldn't believe it. 
And uh, so we set up 35 rooms for these people. Actually, it was we had about four in the gym and elsewhere where we could put more groups, small groups of people. And then we had, they conducted two workshops in the morning and two workshops in the afternoon. We actually, the night before, we had a reception for all these people. I had to assign someone to pick these people at the airport in Buffalo and bring them all to Geneseo, which is an hour away. And then we had the meetings all day long, and then we fed them again. And on Saturday morning, we took them all, took them all back to the airport and sent them home. And everybody was impressed with the new hands-on science programs. And the superintendent had purchased some of these kits so teachers who were interested could call and get these kits for eight to ten weeks to use to teach in their classrooms. That's going on now. And that's my career. That really had some interesting twists. Uh, the one thing I was going to say when you were talking about leadership, actually, I was going to use the word innovation because it struck me that uh, you were very innovative. You used your natural internal curiosity to give you new ideas and then we come up with ways to implement them. Obviously, you worked with others, but we were able to put together a team approach that allowed a lot of innovation literally across the globe. Yeah, yeah, and it worked. I was gung-ho. I didn't ask for any pay. I just wanted to be available to share any wisdom or knowledge or experience that I had. And they said, sure, I'd love to have you do it. So, Well, John, I want to thank you again for taking the time to sit down and tell me a little bit more about your story, and I look forward to continuing this conversation. Sounds good. Thank you, Tom. I appreciate it. This is Tom Fox. If you're an artist, a writer, a speaker, or have another craft, I'd love to visit with you about your craft on Greetings and Felicitations, the podcast where I get to explore a wide variety of non-compliance topics. It's a lot of fun, great listenership, people are very interested, and frankly, it's a passion project for me. So if you're interested, send me an email, tfox at tfoxlaw.com. Thanks so much for listening.